Grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast bringing you true crime from around the world. I'm your host, Cambo. Grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast. Hi, Islanders. So, if you listened to last week's episode, you'll already know the subject of this week's case, Christopher Wilder. So, sorry for the delays, but other than the Missing in Michigan event that I helped out with, things have been very hectic on the island especially at this new account I'm on. I'm pretty much exhausted when I get home, and so I may be doing one episode every two weeks for a month or two until everything settles down a bit. I was working at a major airline until the flu hit, and that industry was (laughs) decimated. Let's hope we all get over this thing soon, get the planes in the air so, of course, I can go and see the lovely Kate again. It has been eight months now. Okay, now my main reference for this episode is the book by Duncan McNabb called The Snapshot Killer, and it's definitely worth a read or listen if you have Audible, which I've had to do because I just don't have time to turn pages. Now, Wilder Wilder would also be known as the Beauty Queen Killer, and these names came about from his M.O., which we'll get to as the story progresses. So, let's get stuck right into it. Christopher Wilder was born in Sydney, Australia on March 13, 1945, to his Australian mother, June, and American Naval Officer Father Coley Wilder. June was from Ride, northwest of Sydney, and this will become important later on. Coley Wilder was a Pearl Harbor and Battle of Midway veteran. Now, Coley met June when he was stationed in Sydney towards the end of the Second World War, while the damaged destroyer he was posted on was being repaired. In April 1946, the family left Australia to go live in the USA, and Coley Wilder stayed in the Navy. Being a military family, they would move from base to base around the country and also Coley was posted to the Philippines. When Coley retired from the Navy in the late 50s, the family, now with two more boys, came back to Sydney to live and that's in Ride near June's family where they would have another boy. Wilder nearly died at birth and at three years old he nearly drowned in a backyard pool but he was revived. He was an average student who was more interested in sport Now, in Australia, we are more into cricket and footy, whereas Wilder was more into baseball, which is this part of his Americanism coming out of him. He failed in his intermediate certificate, which is the equivalent of year 10, and then he left school. He was reasonably tall and good-looking, and with his American accent, he was a bit exotic, so to speak, you know. He wasn't a typical Aussie yobbo, and he used this to pull the girls. Now, it's said that in his teenage years, he would roam the neighbourhood and look in ladies' windows, doing the peeping Tom thing. At age 17, Wilder bought a white Morris Minor. Now, it's nowhere near a glamorous or sporty type car, but it was a car, and that in itself was a cool thing back in the day. Now, Wilder and his mates from Ride, they would pack the car with surfboards and check out the beaches north and south of Sydney but they mostly ended up at Freshwater Beach, one north of Manly and Queenscliff Beaches. Now, they became known as the Ride Boys, and Freshwater became their local. Although Wilder's mates would surf the waves, he never rode a surfboard and hardly at all, if ever, went in the water. He saw the packed beaches during the summer school holidays, not to swim, but to perv on the young girls and women. At Freshwater Beach on the 4th of January 1963, Wilder was at the beach without his mates this time, but he started chatting to two other boys. Now, they were all mucking around with a couple of girls at the water's edge, and one of the girls was only 13. The next thing you know, the 13-year-old girl is being dragged into the back of Wilder's car under the pretense of driving her home. 
Now, Wilder drove with one of the other boys in the back of the car and the other one in the passenger seat. The girl in the back seat got worried when they passed her house and she tried to escape. Now, Wilder drove to an abandoned quarry at Willandra Road, Beacon, Beacon Hills. It's here that Wilder will rape this 13-year-old girl. The other two boys will do nothing to stop him and then he will drive her home as if nothing happened. Now, the girl would go to police with her mother and Wilder and the two other boys would be interviewed by police. Now, Wilder and those other guys were charged. Wilder with rape and carnal knowledge and one of the other boys as being an associate to carnal knowledge and the other boy to assaulting a female. Now, Wilder had a good lawyer and his family was respectable, his father being a war veteran. The other two guys didn't have the same resources or good family behind them. Wilder and his lawyer were able to twist the story around to make the other two boys the instigators of the rape and that Wilder was actually drawn into the situation by them. Now, he had the rape charges dismissed under a deal that he pled guilty to the lesser charge of carnal knowledge. Wilder's lawyer vigorously cross-examined the 13-year-old girl, which they can't do nowadays, but still, she told the court Wilder was the main instigator and the other boys walked away The only thing they did was sort of not help her. Now, Wilder got a smack on the wrist with the judge saying, I don't think he'll do it again. He got a 12-month suspended sentence. Now, the other two guys got nine-month suspended sentences, even though, really, their only crime was the moral one of not going to the girl's defence while Wilder raped her. In January 1967, Wilder was at Palm Beach, north of Sydney, and it's here that he would meet his future wife. Now, I haven't got names here at all. She was 20 years old with her 15-year-old sister and her mother and her father. Now, he chatted with them and soon got to know them quite well, but he placed most of his attention whenever he he met the family on the younger 15-year-old, until the father took him aside one day and told him that she's too young for you, mate. Now, this didn't deter Wilder. He just moved his attention to the older 20-year-old. Now, one day he took the older one to a secluded place and asked her to pose nude for him. Now, she refused and Wilder told her that if she didn't, he would force her to have sex. She told him she wouldn't go out with him again if he did that and he actually backed off. A few months later, though, she was in a full sexual relationship with him. Now, the family hated Wilder and wanted the daughter to stop seeing him. Instead, she left home and went to live in a shelter. Now, get this. Wilder then went to the family home a few days later after the daughters moved out. Now, he let himself in via the open back door and only the mother was home. He checked this out before he did this. Now, he startled her. He was standing in the hallway. Now, Wilder then asked the mother to have sex with him, grabbing her arm. Now, she pulled away and told him she'd kill him if he tried. She then told him to get out or she'd call the police. Now, Wilder did leave but smashed the glass in the front door as he left. I mean, what the fuck? His girlfriend's left home to be with him, basically. He's going home trying to get into the mother. Still, the 20-year-old daughter, she didn't leave him and they would be married on the 27th of February, 1968. Wilder at this time had an established MO. He would go to the beaches, find young, innocent girls and lure them to secluded places on the pretense that he was a modelling agent. Of course, the photo shoots soon turned to nude shoots and he would try to get sex as well. Later in the year, the marriage obviously wasn't going so well. Now, at one stage, Wilder, his wife and the younger sister, they were at the we- at a wedding. Now, his wife had to leave and Wilder then tried to get the young sister on her own. Now, he almost did, but then a mother came and saved her. Later, he would call her up and pretend to be a modelling agent. This is the young, the young, younger daughter. So he's ringing her up, pretending, oh, hi, I saw you in this wedding shoot, the wedding photos from the wedding they'd been at before. 
Now, at first, the young girl, she was flattered. But then she sort of realised from the American accent that it was actually Wilder on the phone and she hung up. But that didn't deter him. He called back using his Australian accent, but her mum answered and that was the end of that. Now, it just shows how creepy this guy was in the relationship with one daughter but is trying to get the mother and the little sister into bed. As I said, the marriage wasn't going well and a couple of strange things ended up happening to his wife. First, the brakes failed on her car, then the steering failed and Wilder was the one who worked on the car. Then one day she woke to the strong smell of gas and the burners on on the stove were left on. Now, she would say that at first the sex was normal, but then Wilder started to want more and more in positions that would hurt her He then progressed to anal sex, which she didn't enjoy, and he was starting to become more violent. Then Wilder met a young nurse at the beach and told her she would be great as a model. He asked her if she wanted to get some photos, and she declined his invitation for this photo shoot at first, but then Wilder was able to convince her to come with him. Long story short, He got nudes and he also took motion film of her from a hand crank movie camera. It wasn't just videos on phone like TikTok now. If you had a video camera back then, you might have a motorized one. You might have a hand cranked one. So that's what he was doing. She was embarrassed by what had happened, but she only let him take the photos because he'd become threatening and she feared for her safety. You know, she's on her own. He gets them alone. And he starts, if he doesn't get what he wants, he starts to get violent. But Wilder, he knew her name, he knew her address and where she worked. So what's he do? He calls her up and wants a meet up. Now she resisted at first, but then he used the threat of publishing her nudes to get her to comply. He met her at Manly Beach, but she brought a friend along with her. Now, Wilder changed tack and told her that he would destroy her nude photos and negatives if she lured other girls for him. Now, this sounds a bit like Epstein and Maxwell, the way that he didn't do the procuring. He got other people to do it. Or Maxwell got the young girls that she'd got in. If they weren't interested, well, get me other girls, we'll leave you alone. Now, she did do this, but one day Wilder demanded to meet her and he picked her up in his car. He told her to lay down in the back seat and drove her to an apartment. It's here he raped her, and I'll say rape, as it was non-consensual. The only reason she was doing it was because she was being blackmailed. He then took her home, throwing what was a film canister out the window into a river as they drove over a bridge. Now, this is while he's married, and the young nurse would eventually tell her mother what had happened, and they would go to the police. At the station, she told the officer that she wanted this guy stopped but didn't want to go through a court case. She told him the story about how she was approached to do a photo shoot and then coerced into doing nudes and then she was blackmailed into providing him other girls and eventually she was raped. Now, Wilder hadn't given given her his correct name but thank God she remembered the rego on his car. Now, police were able to track it to him and for a bit they stalked him, making him feel a little bit uneasy. At home, he would pace and look out the window for police cars. Eventually, they raided his place and discovered hundreds of photos of young women and girls, some nude and some with bikinis. Now, his wife was shocked to see some of the girls were not only wearing her dresses, they were wearing her bikinis as well. And they were items she had had no idea how they'd gone missing previously. Like, wonder where my dress has gone. Wonder where my undies are gone. Wonder where my bikinis are gone. He's taken them to his photo shoots on the weekends and take, given them to the girls to pose him. Now, police ended up telling the wife, never go back. And she moved out that day. And thank God she didn't go back. Now, it would be his wife and her mother that would later tell police that they suspected Wilder as being the one who killed Marianne Schmidt and Christine Sharrick at Wanda Beach on the 11th of January 1965. Now, this was one of the most shocking crimes in Australian history, and it was and still is unsolved. Now, if you heard my original episode on the Wanda Beach murder, 
murders or listen to last week's reprise episode. At first, I didn't really have Wilder as the main suspect, but since researching this case, I now believe it was probably him that brutally raped and stabbed those two 15-year-old girls. He lived not far from them. He did look the surfy type that was described as the boy that had gone off with the girls in the Sandhills. Now, I won't go into that case any further here as I've covered it already, but Wilder was a violent sexual predator and had been for years before the Wanda Beach murders. And I believe when he murdered those girls, he was just escalating his crimes. And I thought he also just used his American accent and all that exoticness to lure these girls away. And I believe it was already planned. He met them in ride near where they lived and had planned to meet them at the beach that day. Anyway, fearing that he would be now suspected of any rape that occurred up and down the beaches of Sydney, Wilder took off to live in the US of A in 1969. Now, those close calls in Australia with the police were a world away from the beaches of Florida where Wilder would further hone his skills. Now, being a dual citizen, he was able to come and go from both countries easier and also work. At first, he stayed at his grandma's house while he settled in and got himself established in the building boom, moving to a nice place at Bonton, Bonton Beach, Florida, Construction and real estate would give Wilder the ability to afford fast cars and live in luxury. Wilder's modelling scam worked because he approached many young girls and women. It was a percentage game. The more he stalked and tried his luck, the percentages dictated that eventually he would claim another victim. On the other hand, the more he did this, the more likely he would be reported to police. But back in the day, rape victims had an even harder time than they do today. They would get a hard time from the cops, society and in the courtroom. You you know, they'd say things like she had it coming to her. She was wearing a miniskirt, all that bullshit. So there was a huge barrier if you tried to get justice. And Wilde took this into his calculations. He was arrested on March 1971 at Pompano Beach, north of Fort Lauderdale. He tried to pick up a teenager with the modelling scam but asked for nudes too quickly. She got a bit spooked and she reported him. He was charged with disorderly conduct and fined $15 plus $10 court fees. Now, whenever he'd been caught in the past, he would act remorseful. He'd try to lessen his culpability and it seemed to do the trick and keep him out of jail. He would then go straight back to doing it again. As he crawled up the social ladder, he kept a low profile, eventually meeting and living with a woman for seven to eight years. He set up a dog breeding business with her and they moved to a semi-rural place in, I'll try and get this right, Loxahatchee West. And that's Loxahatchee West. I'll I'll get it right in a sec. Loxahatchee, and that's west of Palm Beach. Jesus, Jesus. She said she said he was vain, he liked name goods and didn't have many close friends at all. Well, he had one who was a business partner. She also said that he was a neat freak, expected her home when he got home and when he went to the beach he wouldn't go for a swim, he would go with his camera, especially on weekends when he would tell his wife that he was actually going into the office for work. In contrast to his ex-wife, she said sex was normal. I reckon it was just a partnership of convenience for Wilder, someone to take care of the domestic things, to have regular sex with, and someone who didn't question what he did when he was out and about. She would eventually find a stash of his photos. Again, they were all young women in bikinis at local beaches. She eventually got tired of his affairs, and this ended their relationship, but they did remain friends. She said that his greatest fear was ending up in jail. On Friday the 1st of October 1976 at Boca Raton, south of his place, he had stalked a young 16-year-old girl. Now, from what I can gather, she was the daughter of one of the clients that he'd done some work for, construction work. She went out to buy some smokes and on her return, Wilder had parked his car 
as if it had broken down. So he'd been stalking her for a while, and so he knew her movements. As she walked past him, he called her over to help him, saying that he had fixed a leak in the roof of her family home. He asked if she would take him back to her place where he could finish the repairs to the truck. Now, she did agree, and they jumped in the in the truck and drove off. Now, just think, it's supposed to be broken down, but it, it just started up straight away, as if nothing's wrong. I, I, I guess she didn't pick up on that little bit. Anyway, he then said he had to see his boss, and it wasn't far away. Now, she didn't think much of it, but on the way to apparently going to see his boss, he pulled over in a secluded area, and he flashed his dick at her. He told her that she was going to do everything he told her to do. He demanded she jack him off now as he slapped her in the face. He dragged her out of the truck, ripped open her shirt and groped her boobs. She was screaming, but then she decided to try to do what he said to make him calm down and hopefully prevent him from raping her. He then told her to get back in the truck, but it was now bogged. He got it free and they drove off. He demanded that she suck him off and she only did so just to calm him down. He then changed from violent to being gentle, trying to convince her that he wasn't going to rape her and that she had probably actually liked it and wanted it. He then offered to take her to the cops to report him if she wanted to and in the end he would drop her off near her boyfriend's place. He then chatted like nothing had happened and offered to get her a job at the construction firm that he worked for. This is just crazy stuff. But she ended up telling her parents, and they went to the construction company that Wilder worked for. They waited for him to turn up in the morning, and she pointed him out. The sheriff was called, and they took him downtown. He was charged with sexual battery, but he tried to lessen his culpability by saying he'd actually offered to take her to the sheriff's after the incident. He sort of trying to say that I thought she wanted it. He apologised to the owner of the construction firm as well. Now, he was basically just trying to sweet talk his way out of this. He was assessed for his fitness to stand trial. The psychiatrist said he was not a mentally disordered sex offender. He's not insane and doesn't have a mental disorder. He then said he's not dangerous to others in regards to sex offenders. Oh, God, how wrong you can be. He pleaded not guilty to the charges, even though he had already admitted he did it, because he said she'd given him a certain amount of consent. Guess what? He was found not guilty. He moved out of the area, as he was now known as a sexual predator, and moved to Boynton Beach. With his girlfriend leaving him in 1979, the one that had been with for seven or eight years, he went back to Australia to visit his parents. Now, he didn't stay long and the police didn't question him over the Wanda Beach murders either. He then went back to Florida. Now, in regards to this Wanda Beach things, the police did initially go looking for him, but as he moved out of the country, they just stopped. And when he came back into the country, there's no computerised system back then that would flag his name saying that he's wanted for questioning in a double murder. They did have a very basic system. Your name would be on it for about 90 days and if you didn't come back in 90 days, it would fall off the system. So he was able to slip back into Australia, see his parents and slip back out again. With no girlfriend or wife, he would be seen about town with one or more escorts. He liked them white pretty, big busted and dumb. The latter, I guess, so that they wouldn't fall for his bullshit. And just a side note, when he was in Australia, he used his American accent to get the girls. And now he's in America, he uses his Australian accent for the exact same thing. In 1980, on the 21st of June, he targeted two 18-year-old girls at Palm Beach. He used two girls to lure them in, who were paid escorts he'd hired to help him to get these girls. Now, those two girls looked like twins. So he went back to his modelling scam, posing as an agent for Barbizon Modelling, a well-known acting and modelling firm. With the two girls and using the modelling agency, this put these two girls they approached at ease. He suggested test shots at first and then asked them to take off their bras. 
They're in the shopping centre, right? This is just approaching them in the shopping centre. He told them they couldn't be shy if they wanted to make it in modelling. Now, they went to the toilets, took off their bras, while he watched them walk past the entrance to a department store, saying his eyes were the camera. So he hasn't actually got a camera with him. He's just standing there. He's just saying, oh, look, my eyes are a camera. By this stage, the twin escorts he'd hired to lure the girls in had disappeared. Now, Wilder then told the two girls he had to get equipment from his car and stay there while he walked off. Now, when he walked to his car, these twins, they actually walked past the two girls and said, we're going home. Good luck. Now, Wilder's equipment was T-shirts with Barbizon written on the back. He told them to go to Jefferson Mall with him. Now, they had their own car, but he wanted one of them to go in with him. They declined the offer and met him at the mall, and there was a new Thunderbird on display. There was a model there, and she was getting photos taken of her. Now, Wilder told the girls that he'd actually organised that shoot. Long story short, Wilder split the girls up, drugged one, got her into the back of his truck, drove to a quiet part around the back of the building where he raped her. Now, the other girl got worried when her friend had gone missing for a while and security was alerted. Now, the girl that was with Wilder ended up turning up and she looked really woozy, wasn't steady on her feet. Now, the two girls were taken to the police station and statements were taken. The raped girl was checked over, fingernail scraping, semen samples and the like. Even though DNA forensics was really years and years away, blood types could be determined. Now, the semen sample came back as a type A secreter. She had no drugs in her system, but some pizza Wilder had given her and the leftover bit had been thrown into a dumpster. Well, this bit was recovered and it tested positive for LSD. Now, the fact that she had no traces of drugs in her body probably meant that it had already been metabolised and was untraceable. Now, the girls didn't have Wilder's rego of his truck or really his name, but described him really well. The cops, they have a, had a pretty good database at the time, and with Wilder's MO and the description of him, they were able to narrow it down to him being the prime suspect. The girls picked him out of a photo lineup as well, and he was arrested on July 3rd, 1980. He was remorseful in the back of the cop car as he was driven downtown. He'd said he'd been seeing a doctor for his problems and he did pose as a modelling agent to take photos of girls, so he's admitting that. But again, he tried to lessen his crime. He was charged with sexual battery, but this time pleaded guilty in a deal that got him probation for five years with good behaviour conditions and mental health care. He got away with it again. Okay, so this is where I'm going to leave part one of the Christopher Wilder case. Next week, we're still in 1980 and things are going to escalate dramatically. So before I go, a big shout out to all my Patreons, Jess Saunders, Doug Armistead, Lisa King, Holly and Rick Smith, Rihanna Sava and Deborah Marshall. Thank you so much for your support. True Crime Island, of course, is a commercial-free podcast and it's free for all. If you'd like to help out, go to patreon.com forward slash true crime island. It really does help keep the lights on. If you want to buy me a beer, you can shout me on paypal.me forward slash true crime island. Links to merch, social media and my YouTube channel is on my website truecrimeisland.com where you can also email me. Okay, so let's get ready for this next episode. It's really going to get crazy from now. So, I've been your host, Cambo. You've been listening to True Crime Island. And as I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. Good night. Boom, fucker,